Hi, I'm Ryan North. I'm a writer of fiction and nonfiction and all sorts of things, but a lot of what I do is comics. So this is a, a world domination scheme that is interesting, it's effective, it has a social good, and it is shockingly affordable. So this is the How to Control the Weather, a case study in supervillainy talk, but don't worry, we're all in the right place. This is actually going to talk about government and governance too. So, I'm a writer, you start with motivations. Why do you want to control the weather? Why would anyone want to control the weather? Why are we talking about controlling the weather when we could talk about controlling the climate? When we could talk about controlling the climate? When we could talk about controlling the climate? Let's go as big as we possibly can. And if we want to take over, take over, take over, govern the world, we want it to be a place where people aren't fighting over increasingly scarce drinking water and habitable land. So our motivations here are pretty clear. But today, to bring the atmospheric CO2 back to pre-industrial levels would take 9 million square kilometers of trees. To put that in perspective, that is two India's worth of surface area, or 40% of the Earth's habitable, arable land. And you cannot get rid of almost half of Earth's farmland without killing a bunch of people. Without killing a bunch of people. Without killing a bunch of people. So this is also, unfortunately, out. How we're going to solve this problem like a supervillain? You, acting alone, are going to create a powerful and sustained artificial volcano. The first is by putting ash into the troposphere. That's the part of the world, part of the atmosphere where we spend all our time. It's where weather happens. And you can shoot ash up there to block the sun, block the sun, block the sun. What we want is the stratosphere. Sulfuric acid, once it's up there, interacts with dust in the stratosphere. Sulfuric acid plus dust gives you an aerosol. An aerosol is really just a white haze, a white haze, a white haze that's sitting up there in the stratosphere. And what a white haze does is it reflects sunlight. So sunlight comes towards this white haze, bounces off it back into space before it can warm the ground that we're on, and this produces a cooling climate and a slightly dimmer one. And the advantage we have is it only takes a 2% reduction in light to bring global temperatures back to pre-industrial levels. Better still, stuff in the stratosphere can hang out there for a year or more before it falls, falls back to Earth. So we're doing great. And you might think, if you know your science, you might think, hey, Ryan, uh, <laughs> this sounds an awful like, like, awful lot like what happened to the dinosaurs when a giant asteroid hit and it blocked out the sun, and didn't they all die? And the answer is yes, but we will just be more careful than that. <laughs> so what is our plan? Easy four steps. Step one, we need a chemical precursor. This can be sulfur dioxide. This can be ammonium sulfate. This can be anything that produces a white haze will do it for us. Step two is to get the chemicals up into the atmosphere. Step three is to spray them out in tiny droplets to make an aerosol. And step four is to re repeat this once a year. And that's it. We have successfully taken a warming climate and replaced it with a cooling one. Problem solved forever. The US government stands ready to assist us with the Lockheed U-2 high-altitude aircraft that has an operational ceiling of 21 kilometers straight up well into the stratosphere. If you don't like planes, there's other options. You could do a hot air balloon, hot air balloon, hot air balloon, $2 billion in yearly cost plus $7 billion in startup costs. This is a shockingly affordable scheme. This uses existing technology and this solves a literal problem. Why hasn't anyone done it yet? Which brings us to the downsides. And I promise they're not what you think. You might think, okay, if you stop seeding the skies, then everything catches up all at once in the space of a year. All climate change happens right in that year. And you're right. Maintaining this case, this haze requires constant technological intervention. You might think, okay, well, what about Acid rain, acid rain, acid rain. That could happen by putting sulfuric acid in the stratosphere. And yes, that would happen. But the effects of that are orders of magnitude less than that of climate change. Like this is a win here, a win here, a win here. We're doing less damage than we could. And you might say, okay, well, we've never altered the atmosphere, altered the atmosphere, altered the atmosphere before. And this is true. This is, there's uncertainty in doing this. But you don't have to alter the atmosphere if you don't want to. You could always just put giant mirrors in space to reflect sunlight away from the Earth and keep everyone cooling it down that way. The issue is that there's always going to be uncertainty. We can't predict what will happen, and any technology can be misused. What if people turned those mirrors around and burned us all like ants? This would be a problem. <laughs> so uncertainty is always there. Who do we blame when something goes wrong? Who do we blame when something goes wrong? Who do we blame when something goes wrong? Who do we blame for the weather? That if there is to be a global thermostat, why do you get to control it? Why don't I control it? I am going to control it. <laughs> I'm going to take it from you. This idea of geoengineering, of changing the Earth's climate to solve climate change technologically works on paper, but it falls apart when you start to consider human nature. But it falls apart when you start to consider human nature. But it falls apart when you start to consider human nature. And what began with the best of intentions has instead become a recipe for war and chaos and disaster. Because weather is now political, 
in every natural disaster, now unintentionally but irrevocably, has human desires behind it.